Passover, the bread, and the wine. We've been looking at how Old Testament is reflected in the New, how it points to the New Testament, and how the New Testament reveals something new to us, particularly about Jesus. And so today we're going to look at the Old Testament Passover and how that points to or is reflected upon with what we know as communion. Uh, how many of you have a background at all in Catholic or Episcopal churches? Raise your hand. So that, that you potentially grew up, as Mike sort of described earlier, with Mass and with uh, Eucharist, or as we know, it's communion uh, every Sunday. How many of you grew up in a tradition where you only had communion once a quarter, every three months? A couple of you. Uh, and some maybe even just once a year. Now, how many of you grew up with the tradition that we practice, which is once a month? You have communion. Oh, you faithful Baptist. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah, and there really is no dogmatic rule. Jesus simply said, every time you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Pass over the bread and the wine. Let's pray. God, open our hearts to understand, open our minds to perceive. Give us a clearer understanding today. Father, for most of us, we're not going to learn anything new, but we're going to be reminded. And that's what Passover is about, Lord. For the Jewish people, it reminds them of what you did, setting them free from slavery in Egypt to go into the Promised Land. And so communion, in the same way, Lord, reminds us that you have set us free from the burden of sin to enter the promised land, eternal life in heaven with you. And now, Lord, according to Psalm 119, we ask that you would open our eyes to see the wonderful things in your word. Old Testament Passover is the very moment that God truly becomes God to the Hebrew people. Think about it for a few moments. Um, what were the people doing prior to Passover? What was this nation of Israel who were slaves down in Egypt, what was their relationship with God like? Did they have synagogues? Did they have community worship? There's a lot we don't really know. There's a whole lot of silence around that, around exactly what their relationship with God was during this time. So let's do a little historical review. We're going to go back even further uh, to the, the real beginning of the Hebrew people, which goes back to Abraham. <coughs> and God comes to Abraham and asks him to leave the land of Ur and to go to the land of Canaan, which becomes the promised land, to pick up his family and all his belongings and go. And he is obedient to God, and he does that. And then Abraham gives birth to a son in Abraham's old age, a son named Isaac. And Isaac gives birth to a son named <coughs> Jacob. Okay, so we're a couple generations now in the land of Canaan, in this promised land. And Jacob gives birth to 12 sons. He has two wives, and each of them have handmaidens. And because the wife he truly loves, the one he really wanted to marry, but was sort of tricked into marrying her older sister first, she had some children for Jacob. Her handmaiden had some children for Jacob. The wife he loved could not bear children for some reason, and so her handmaiden had children for Jacob. And then finally, after ten children are born to Jacob, the wife he loves <coughs> gives birth to one child and then another. Twelve sons. Number eleven sons' name is Joseph. Joseph is the favorite of all the sons by Jacob because he is the firstborn of the one that Jacob really wanted. So much does he love this son more than the others that he gives him this coat of many colors to signify, look, this is the best child I've got. 
We don't want to follow that kind of example. But it sets up something quite unique. It's, it continues God's story. Because not only does Jacob favor Joseph, but it seems that God has some favor with Joseph. Because God gives Joseph dreams. And some of those dreams are about his 11 brothers and even his father and mother bowing down to him. The brothers don't take kindly to this. And so at the first opportunity they have when they're out of town, they decide they're going to kill Joseph. This is going to upset Jacob. It's weird looking over and seeing Bill sitting there who played Jacob in our production of Joseph. Um, and so Jacob you know, would not be pleased with what the brothers were doing. Of course, he didn't know what was going on. So the brothers are going to kill Joseph, and then some of them have a little more sense to say, no, we really can't do that. Oh, here comes some slave traders going to Europe, to Egypt. Let's sell him to them. Let's make some money. Let's take his coat and tear it up. Let's get the, an animal and kill it and put blood on it. Take the coat back to our father and tell him that Joseph is dead. He'll never be the wiser. And this favor will be gone, but his blood won't be on our hands. It'll just look like it is. So that's what they do. This is setting up the whole story of God. Joseph is down in Egypt. He is basically a slave, working in a household uh, as a steward, and he rises up in the ranks, and he's trusted until something happens where he's thrown into prison. No fault of his own. And he's there for a long time. He interprets some dreams of some people while he's there. Years go by. Pharaoh has a dream, and nobody, none of the wisest people in all of Egypt can interpret Pharaoh's dream. So Pharaoh hears about this Joseph character, brings him up out of prison, and has him interpret Pharaoh's dream. The dream basically is this, or the interpretation is, we're going to have seven years of abundant crops in Egypt, followed by seven years of famine. So Pharaoh, what you should do is store up all of the uh, extra crops over these seven years so we can get through the seven years of famine. Pharaoh is so impressed with Joseph that he makes him second command in all of Egypt and overseeing this project of making sure that Egypt's going to have enough food for the seven years of famine. And sure enough, that's exactly what happens. After those first seven years, there's famine not just in Egypt, but in that whole part of the world, including Canaan, or as we know it as Israel. And so there's Jacob and the 11 sons starving to death. And Jacob sends down the 10 oldest ones and then eventually the 11th one, because Joseph asked for him, even though they don't know who Joseph is, they don't recognize him uh, as this Egyptian he's become. Uh, and then finally, uh, Joseph, getting the father to come down to, Jacob to come down, reveals himself, who he really is, forgives his brothers for what they've done, and Jacob brings all of his family, all of his belongings down to Egypt, and they settle in Egypt because they have the favor of Joseph and therefore the favor of Pharaoh. What happened to the promised land? What happened to Canaan? It's sitting there. It's occupied by other people over many, many, many years, over hundreds of years. In fact, time goes by, and the Hebrew people become so vast they, they have this population explosion. And they become strong people. And the Egyptians, including pharaohs, are getting concerned that they may overtake the Egyptians. <coughs> so finally, Pharaoh puts out an edict that every male Hebrew baby who's born is to be immediately killed. And so Pharaoh has Egyptian midwives go all throughout the, the Hebrew people and... Make sure that whenever a Hebrew baby is born, it's killed. Well, these midwives were not real thrilled with this. And there were two Hebrew parents, mother and father, who were not thrilled with this. And so when their male baby was born, they took him, and instead of turning him over to be killed, put him in a basket and stuck him in the Nile River near the palace of Pharaoh, where Pharaoh's daughter found this baby and decided to raise him as her own. His name was Moses. He's raised for 40 years in the palace. He uh, gets a little excited and ends up killing an Egyptian. And then the Hebrews think they're going to kill, he's going to kill them. And so he takes off for another land where he becomes a shepherd for 40 years. So after those 80 years, 370 years now, the people have been in slavery. 
Yes, 370 years. And then God comes to Moses through this burning bush and talks to Moses and says, I want you to go back to the palace, go back to Pharaoh, and tell him to let my people go that they may come and worship me. Moses isn't excited about this, but he doesn't. Pharaoh's not excited at all. He says, no way. God sends nine plagues down upon the people of Egypt, and every time Pharaoh says, no, I'm not going to let you go. And finally, God says, I'm going to send a tenth plague, and let's pick that up in Scripture. I'm sure my math was wrong earlier, but now by the time we get to when the people, when, when Moses goes to tell Pharaoh, uh, it's been 430 years in slavery in Egypt. Because besides uh, killing every male child, the Pharaohs made the Hebrew people slaves. So they also wouldn't grow and prosper so much. Exodus chapter 11, beginning of verse 4. Moses, talking to Pharaoh, says this. This is what the Lord says. Better listen up, buddy. You haven't listened the previous nine times, but you better pay attention to this one. About midnight, I will go throughout Egypt, God says. Every firstborn son in Egypt will die. From the firstborn son of Pharaoh, who sits on the throne, to the firstborn son of the slave girl who is at her mill, and all the firstborn of the cattle as well. This means the firstborn son of the slave girl that the Hebrew people's firstborn sons could die as well, God provides a provision for them. There will be loud wailing throughout Egypt, worse than there ever has been and ever will be again. But among the Israelites, not a dog will bark, nor any man or animal. Then you will know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. Let me jump ahead to the New Testament for just a moment to give you a little note. God does make distinction. We would love it if there were no hell. We want there to just be heaven and for everybody to get there and for our benevolent, loving God just to say, poof, I changed my mind. You don't have to put your trust in Jesus. Uh, just be born and that's good enough. All the way back to here, all the way back to the Garden of Eden, but here again, God makes a distinction. There are those people in Egypt whose firstborn are going to be killed, but he's going to provide a provision now, it's not an automatic guarantee. They have to follow and do what the provision says. But he's going to give them a provision for the Hebrew people where their firstborn will not receive death and then eventually enter back into the promised land. All these officials of yours will come to me, Pharaoh, bowing down to me and saying, Go, you and all the people who follow you. And after that, Pharaoh, I will leave. Exodus chapter 12, verse 3. Tell the whole community. Now, Moses is going to talk to everybody. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of the, this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. Verse 5. The animals you choose must be year old males without defect. Take care of them until the fourteenth day of the month. When all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Verse 7. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and the top of their doorposts, the door frames of the houses where they have eaten the lamb. <coughs> that same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. This is how you're to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. This is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will... Pass over you. There's the provision. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Verse 17. Celebrate the feast of unleavened bread. 
because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for generations to come. You wonder why the Jews celebrate Passover every year. God said, do it. I want to establish this so you remember what I have done for you and how it was done. The fact that the lamb was slaughtered, an innocent, perfect lamb was slaughtered, and the blood covered your house so that death passed over you. Wherever you live, you must eat unleavened bread. Verse 31. During the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron after this took place. He said, get up! Leave and get out of here! Leave my people, you and all the Israelites. Go worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flocks and herds as you said and go. And as you go, Moses, bless me, Pharaoh says. The Egyptians urged the people to hurry to leave the country, for otherwise they said, we will all die. You can imagine the terror throughout the land of Egypt when all of a sudden everybody's firstborn son of man and animal have just died. And now they're afraid that they'll all die if the Hebrew people do not get out of here. So the people took their dough before the yeast was added, carried it on their shoulders in kneading troughs, wrapped in clothing. I just love to look at the wording of things in Scripture. Take this dough that has no yeast, wrapped in clothing or wrapped in cloths. Does that make you mindful of anything? It makes me think about Christmas, where God incarnate in this baby Jesus is what? Wrapped in cloths and laid in a manger. It makes me think a little bit further in time, 30-some years later, when Jesus is crucified on a cross and he's taken down, in preparation for his burial, he is wrapped in cloths. And so this special bread without yeast, and I'm not sure about the without yeast, we'll maybe discover that as time goes on here, is wrapped in cloth. Verse 46, further instructions on the lamb, it must be eaten inside one house. Take none of the meat outside the house. Do not break any of its bones. So the whole community of Israel must celebrate it. What did we talk about, I believe, last week or the week before? That when Jesus was on the cross, the two thieves beside them had their legs broken, their, their bones broken. But the Bible says that none of his bones, none of the Messiah's bones, none of Jesus' bones would be broken. This perfect, spotless lamb who's dying for the sins of the world. So all the way back to the Old Testament, do not break any of the bones. You can't make this stuff up. Nobody is smart enough to look at all these different places throughout the Old Testament and put all these things together and say, okay, Jesus, we're going to make sure you live exactly this way. Uh, there's no way they can have influence over the guards who wanted to break his legs. One of them says, no, look, he's already dead. We don't need to break him. That's why they break him, so he couldn't push himself up and breathe anymore while hanging on the cross. But just to make sure, let's go ahead and put a spear into his side instead of breaking any bones. It astounds me over and over. So there's Passover in the Old Testament. If you knew, you're reminded. And I'll remind you that a sermon is never meant to teach you anything new. If you come and look for something new every Sunday, you're going to be disappointed. Because I only have a Bible to preach from. It only has 66 books. And if you've been in church very long, You've read the whole thing, you've studied it, and my job is to remind you, isn't that interesting? What did Jesus say about communion? Do this what? In remembrance of me. Why do we partake it? To remember. Why do the Jews take Passover? To remember. To be reminded of these things. So, I've reminded you, or maybe told you for the first time, what Passover is. God was bringing death, but he made a provision that those who had the blood of the lamb over their homes, there would be no death there. Theirs would be life, and not only life, but freedom. They would then be able to leave Egypt to worship God and to enter back into, now after 430 years, that number's correct, um, into the promised land. Now you think about it. They didn't have GPS. 
They hadn't been there for 430 years. It's not in anybody's memory. Well, they sent out some scouts to check out the land to see if they ought to go. Ten of those said, no, we can't. There's giants in the land. Two of them said, yeah, let's go. And it's overflowing with milk and honey. Look at the size of the fruit we brought back. What should have taken about two weeks took 40 years to get there, but they got there. So the New Testament version for us, this new thing, being implemented in the midst of the old thing of the Exodus Passover meal. We now have Jesus instituting this communion meal right in the midst of that Passover meal. So it's, it's inextricably connected to Passover. Jesus comes, he sits at the table with his disciples, and he gets up during the meal, gets a towel and a basin, he washes their feet to show that he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Matthew 26, 1. When Jesus had finished saying all these other things, he said to his disciples, As you know, the Passover is two days away, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Could it be any plainer? If you were one of the disciples and Jesus said that to you, wouldn't that be clear? Passover is in two days, and I'm going to be handed over to be crucified. You'd be concerned at this point. You wouldn't want that to happen. Somehow the disciples just didn't get it completely. Luke twenty-two fourteen. When the hour came, Jesus and the apostles, apostles reclined at the table. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks. He said, take this cup, divide it among yourselves. For I tell you, I will not drink it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. He took bread. He gave thanks for it. He gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He took the cup and said, this is the new covenant, the new covenant, the new agreement, the new contract between God and you, between me and you. The new covenant in my blood, Jesus says, which is poured out for you. Were they deaf? Were they blind that they didn't get it? Of course, we're sitting on this side. And it seems so clear to us. It did get clear a little later on as Paul's writing to the church of Corinth. Chapter 5, verse 7, he says, Get rid of the old yeast. There's that yeast thing again. That you may be a new batch without yeast, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. What is this yeast? We hear about the yeast of the Pharisees in the New Testament. What is all this talk about the yeast and why no yeast? Well, they were to have no yeast because they were leaving in haste. They didn't have time to let the bread rise with the yeast. They had to get out of there quickly. But it certainly has become this great metaphor for all that's bad. Get rid of the yeast. Get rid of the sin. Get rid of that stuff in you that doesn't need to be there. You can still eat bread without yeast. It just doesn't get big and fluffy. I mean, for those of you who like deep, deep dish pizza, you're in trouble. But for those who like thin crust, you're right on. <laughs> we don't let it rise real big into this giant loaf of bread. <coughs> well, Jesus instituted or ordained this meal for us. Just like God instituted or ordained the Passover meal. Jesus wanted us to do it, and every time we did it, he wanted us to remember him. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. Paul speaking with authority to the church of Corinth. What I received, where? From the Lord. I am passing on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. So this is your time of examination, to look inside. In part, it's about sin, right? But it is through this expression that we remember that God has in Christ forgiven us. It might be more simply about our faith. Do you believe that what Jesus did 2,000 years ago, hanging on a cross, was sufficient to forgive your sins, the sins that keep you separate from God. Do you believe that that can actually take place, that what Jesus did as this perfect spotless lamb, dying on a cross, that he really reached forward into history and took your sin, put it into himself, and died as that lamb for you? That's the examination. Do you believe that that can actually happen? That it did happen, that it is happening, that Jesus is doing that work in you in this very moment. That as you confess your sins during this time of communion, that God is faithful and just to forgive you your sins. If so, when we partake of this, you're welcome to participate. You don't come to the table perfect. You walk away from it perfected through what Christ has done for you. Your job is faith. The provision, like the blood over the doorpost, is Jesus dying and shedding his blood for your sin. Notice for a moment the theme of bread uh, throughout the Exodus and Passover experience, throughout the communion uh, experience. After the feeding of the 5,000, the people were thrilled but were not satisfied. And if you remember, Jesus with his disciples that night went over to the other side of the lake. So in the morning, some of the people who remained behind wanted more bread. They wanted more miracles. And so they went over to the other side of the lake until they tracked Jesus down. And they said, we want more of this. And Jesus is looking at them like, thinking inside, he's got to be thinking, I didn't come so that I could give them bread every day. That's my mission yeah, we ought to feed the poor and the hungry, but my mission is not that. My mission is to give life eternal, to forgive people of their sins, to get them into heaven. That's my mission. So Jesus is getting a little ticked off that these people are coming and looking for the wrong thing. John 6, 48 through 59. Jesus speaks to this crowd who's come to him. Look, you guys, I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna, which is like bread, in the desert, yet they died. But the bread, or but here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am that living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he'll live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? It's a good question. Jesus says to them, I tell you the truth, and unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate the manna and died. You ate that bread yesterday and eventually you're going to die. I can keep giving it to you every day, but it doesn't matter. You're still going to die. You need the bread of life. But he who feeds on this bread, Jesus says, will live 
forever. The early disciples began to get this in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. This tells us what those early disciples were doing. It says, And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, the fellowship, and the prayer. So what does the Exodus and Passover that's reflected in our communion service say to us today as we're gathered here together? Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16. Is not the cup of thanksgiving, it's one of the cups during the Passover meal, for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Do you understand? Jesus didn't mean a literally eating of his physical flesh or drinking of his physical blood. But in this way, it's a spiritual act. It's a sacred act. These elements just help symbolize and remind us of what's actually taking place within us. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body and partake of one loaf. Let's review. Take the spotless Passover lamb. Kill it without breaking its bones. Eat it. Take blood and cover the door frame of your home so that when God comes to bring death to the firstborn in all the land, he will pass over you. Let's review. Take the spotless Passover lamb, Jesus. Kill him without breaking his bones. Eat his flesh. Drink his blood and cover the entrance to your home with that blood to your heart. So that when God comes to bring death in all the world, he will pass over you. And finally, Hebrews 10, 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened to us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled by that blood to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. All of us have a desire to be in communion with God. And we cannot do it separate from faith in Jesus Christ. If you have placed your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ and you've examined yourself and know that you have, when we come to this table and you heard two different songs, Call it, come to the table. So today we're going to come to the table. Know that as you partake of this and trust Christ as your Savior, what he did on that cross and what you're doing by faith by taking his flesh and his blood, <clears throat> your sins are forgiven. You walk out of here cleansed, renewed, in the right relationship with God. It doesn't matter how bad you are, what horrible things you've done. Or if you're putting your trust in Christ at this very moment, let this be your first communion of faith in Him. I hope this message was meaningful to you. If you happen to be watching this with family or friends, I'd like to invite you right now to Gather some elements, some juice, and some bread. Sit down together. Uh, after I share a few words of blessing of the elements, then Teddy Snow will be playing and singing some music by which you and your family and friends could uh, gather as the body of Christ. For Jesus said, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in their midst. And you can partake of communion together right there in your home or nursing home or hospital or wherever you have to be. It is meant to be an act of the body. 
And so it's not designed just for you by yourself, but if anyone's with you, or maybe you'd bring somebody over and come back to this part in the video and partake of the Lord's Holy Communion, uh, God bless you as you do. just a guest visiting with us. Um, it did sound good. If you're a guest visiting with us, not just a guest, uh, you're so much a guest that we'd love to invite all of you uh, to come downstairs uh, immediately following the benediction uh, where we'll just share a good time of eating together and uh, letting Joel and Mandy know how much we love and care about them as this will be Mandy and Eli's last Sunday with us. Um, Joel will be here one more Sunday. He will be leaving immediately following next Sunday's service, correct? And he'll be preaching. What you looking for? <laughs> oh, the microphone. Yeah, well, that's all right. Receive the benediction. Now, glory be to God, who by his mighty power at work within us 
is able to do far more than we'd ever dare to ask or even dream of, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, or hopes. Now glory be to God through the church and through Jesus Christ throughout all generations, both now and forever. And all those who remember Jesus say, Amen. This is my body. This is my blood. This is the evidence of 